Hello, Arizona songwriters. How are you? <laughs> I'm Michael Lesko. I'm the founder of Taxi uh, Independent A&R, which, by the way, is celebrating its 30th anniversary this month. Yep, 30 years of perfecting how we help independent songwriters, artists, and composers get record deals, publishing deals, and film and TV music licensing deals and placements. Um, I want to thank uh, John and Ivy. I'm, I'm working from paper today. <laughs> I want to thank John and Ivy for inviting me to speak about uh, getting your music in film and TV. And I'm sorry that I can't be with you for the live session today, but as luck would have it, I have to be on an airplane uh, when this happens, so I'm pre-recording this for you. Um, I'm going to do this in one unedited presentation today. It might not be the slickest production you've ever seen, but it'll be jam-packed with great information, that I promise you. I'm guessing that most of you are songwriters. That's why you belong to Arizona Songwriters. Some of you might be artists or instrumental composers as well, but I'd bet that most of you would love to get your song into a feature film or a TV show or maybe even a big fat TV commercial, right? It's entirely possible. Thousands of taxi members have signed deals with film and TV specific publishers, which are called production music libraries. Thousands of members have had their music used in TV shows, films, and commercials over those 30 years. Thousands, easily. Um, a reality show uses between 75 and 100 instrumental cues in a single episode. A TV drama, like an hour-long uh, TV drama, might use between 3 and 10 songs. Sorry, I've got 18 pages of notes. Going to be a lot of page turns today. Um, some, will be, some of those songs will be featured uses in montages, you know, where the... Uh, there's no uh, dialogue, but the song kind of tells the story. Um, others will be used as background or background source music. Uh, background source is music that's ostensibly playing from something like a jukebox in a bar, the lobby of a hotel, or some cocktail jazz playing in the background of a restaurant scene. The bottom line is that there are a lot more possibilities to get your music used in TV, film, and commercials than there are getting a cut with a big artist on a major record label. They're probably a few hundred signed artists that are looking for songs, you know, and some of those have, write their own material. But in a given day, there are thousands upon thousands of pieces of music uh, used all over the world in TV shows and films and commercials. Um, you know, it, it's just more possibilities, more action. That's the way that goes. So I want to give you some history about music libraries and tell you <clears throat> about the day uh, that everything changed for independent musicians. I call it the shot heard around the world. Um, there was a, a lady named Susan who, uh, in the very early days of Taxi, probably around 1993, I'm guessing, the company was about a year old, and I got a call from a lady that sounded like Joey's agent, Estelle, on Friends. Hello, you know, like New York uh, chain smoking kind of lady. And, and she goes, uh, Can you find me? Um, she owned a production music library, which frankly, I'd use production music libraries in part of my career when I was an audio post production engineer, but I'd never supplied music to one. Well, this lady needed some horrific music. And I said, Horrific as in really bad or like for horror flicks? And she said, The latter. <laughs> So anyway, we ran a taxi listing. We found her some great stuff. I still remember the, na the, the member's name was Steve Clark. I think he was from Van Nuys, California. And that was the shot heard around the world. The, to the best of my knowledge, that was the first time that an independent musician got his music into a production music library. Prior to that, sorry, I've got something in my eye. <laughs> Told you, unedited. Um, <clears throat> Prior to that, production music libraries would have three or four or five composers that they worked with, and they were all like legit composers. They would write their stuff, you know, they would chart it, then they would demo it, probably on something like a four track TAC tape machine with quarter inch tape or maybe a cassette, because um, things like Alesis ADATs and Pro Tools didn't exist yet. Um, so they would pick the best demos and then they would hire, uh, you know, a big brand name studio, hire a bunch of A-list session players, and they would go in and the first day they'd record all the rhythm tracks. The next day they would do string overdubs. The next day they would do horn overdubs, et cetera, et cetera. And then they would mix it and then they would add it to the library. 
Uh, well, the stuff was played by A-list musicians, very well recorded and produced. However, it all sounded kind of the same, homogenous, because it was the same players, basically a handful of composers, the same studio, same engineer, same producer. So uh, it, it was quite a breakthrough when uh, that lady Susan got the music from Steve Clark and all of a sudden bells went off going, wow, there are musicians with home studios that are capable of making music that's good enough to be in TV shows and movies. And that, I believe, was the, the beginning of the revolution of independent people, independent songwriters, artists, and composers getting their stuff in film and TV. Before that, yeah, maybe you live next door to you know a movie director or an executive producer because you were friends, they listened to your music and you got it in that way, but that didn't happen very, very often. Um, most of the music that you hear in TV shows today, other than the scores for the TV shows, are usually done by scoring composers. But all that other music, the background music in bars, um, background music in general, um, instrumental cues used in reality TV, a lot of the music that you hear in commercials, it, it gets done by people like you uh, with home studios. Um, it, it's just amazing to me how, you know, 30 years ago when I started Taxi, nobody even knew that this was an option. It, it wasn't an option, frankly. Um, the film and TV industry is not looking for demos, though, like regular, you know, like uh, a Nashville publisher might be willing to listen to demos. Um, they need stuff that's broadcast quality. That doesn't mean that it has to sound like it was done in, you know, like the record plant or something, but it's got to be better than a demo. So I'm going to give you, a, you know, a minute here on what broadcast quality is. Quite frankly, it just means that it's broadcastable, if that's even a word. Um, it means that the instruments are well recorded, that the mix is well balanced, um, that the vocals aren't pitchy, um, that it's not swimming in reverb unless it's meant to be. Um, and broadcast quality isn't only about the engineering or the mixing. It has something to do with the performance. So like broadcast quality for an artist uh, that's kind of like a Bob Dylan or a Tom Waits type artist, you know, where, where they're kind of mumbly and gravelly and lo-fi and low-key, Broadcast quality for that might literally be as simple as recording an acoustic guitar with like the strings that came from the factory um, into your Mac laptop uh, using the built-in microphone and getting a good balance between the vocal and the guitar. That might actually work for that kind of stuff. Whereas broadcast quality for a pop instrumental track, they want it to sound like a pop record would sound, but without the vocal. So that takes more tracks, more work. But, you know, there's a lot of broadcast quality stuff out there that, quite frankly, is done with just a few instruments. Um, one of the examples I love to use is when uh, Duck Dynasty was still on the air. A ton of our members were getting their instrumental cues in that show. And very often those cues only had a couple of instruments, maybe two, three or four instruments at the most. Um, the guys are getting ready to go out and do whatever they do, hunting, fishing, whatever. Um, and, and they get into their ATVs and they're going down a country road at, you know, the, at first light. And you hear something like an acoustic guitar just playing a big arpeggiated open chord strum combined with maybe like a, you know, a slide on a dobro. And that's it. It might be like one or two acoustic guitar parts and that dobro, and there's the whole track. Um, could you do that with a $200 USB microphone and garage band? Yeah. Could you do it even better with a, um, you know, Pro Tools or Logic? Yeah, absolutely. But the truth of the matter is you can get that kind of quality at home today. And a lot of people think that you need to have the, this like super you know, sophisticated track. People think when they hear the word composer, they think of a guy with a baton, you know, and charts and doing like Hans Zimmer kind of stuff. And um, sometimes it can simply be a couple of acoustic guitar tracks and a dobro. Um, sometimes it could be an acoustic guitar and a harmonica. Other times it could be a pop rock track with bass, drums, keyboards, guitars. Other times it could, in fact, be a big bombastic orchestral piece. Um, it could be EDM. It could be 
cocktail jazz, solo piano, cocktail jazz, one of the most consistently placed types of material that's ever been out there because there are always restaurant scenes in film and TV, and cocktail jazz works really great in the background of that, especially if it's a fancy restaurant, you know, like a, the couple in the movie is going out to dinner uh, for an anniversary or something. What's going to be playing in the background? Probably like smooth jazz or cocktail jazz. Um, so, but creating music for media is very different than trying to create a hit song. The decision makers in the music for media world aren't really looking for hits. They're not looking for the best song, if you can believe that. They're looking for the right song. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, a B plus song will beat out an A plus song because the B plus song has the right mood um, to support the scene, the right emotions, the right lyrics. So an A song that doesn't really nail that or doesn't work against the tempo of the scene when they watch the, the scene and play the music against it. So for all those reasons, um, a B plus song or an A minus or an A could beat out an A-plus song. Um, so let's talk about instrumentals for a minute. Uh, as I just explained to you, instrumentals can be all kinds of things. And people are like, but I don't want to do instrumentals. I, I want to write hits. I want to write you know, art that's coming from my musical soul. And I get that. But here's the cool thing about doing instrumentals for film and TV is that you get really fast at your recording and production skills uh, because you're doing it every day. You're just in practice, you know, and uh, you start setting up templates. Let's say you're doing uh, an instrumental hip hop track that might get used, you know, in a reality TV show. Well, if you're going to do one of those, why don't you just keep all your instrument sounds and all your settings the same and just create a second piece after you've done the first one and you're happy with it, then do another one with a different mood, a different attitude, a different key, a different tempo, but all the instrument sounds are there. So you could do four, five, six, seven of those, and then you've got a collection of them, which is something the production music libraries, which again are film and TV specific music publishers, they want generally more than one thing. They love it when they meet a new composer and they say, do you have more of that? Why, yes, I do. Yay, so now you got a half a dozen things signed into that catalog versus just one. Um, so how much do you make? Sometimes as little as like, you know, 50 cents for a placement. Uh, and, and for instrumental stuff, you generally speaking don't get any upfront money. You don't get a sync fee, but where you make a killing is on the back end. Um, we have taxi members that are making six figure incomes, 100,000, 150,000, 200,000. The most I ever heard was back in like 2016 or 17. One of our members that had been doing it for about, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years, was up to making $280,000 a year, largely from doing what I affectionately call stupid little instrumental cues that get used for five seconds here, 22 seconds there, a minute there. They hardly ever use the entire cue, by the way. Um, some of our members make a few thousand a year. Some of them make a few hundred extra a year because they can only do this part time. Um, a lot of our members make nothing because they don't really do the work. You know, people that had an album they recorded 10 years ago, they pressed up 25 or, uh, you know, 500 copies at disc makers. Uh, they sold 25 of those CDs and now they've got 475 of them sitting in boxes in their garage and they get a brilliant idea. They're going to join Taxi and send in the music on that CD and everybody in the industry is going to go, wow, this is the best thing I've ever heard. But unfortunately, uh, that usually doesn't work because number one, the music could be dated. Number two, it's not going to generally fit what the companies have asked for. So, you know, those members don't fare that well. It's the members that read the briefs that we send out. We call them industry listings and sit down and carefully study that thing for five minutes and then sit down with a purpose in mind and create music to fill that request, fill that need. Um, so one of the things that I hear all the time from our members that do get placements, whether it's a, you know, a song and a big hit feature film or a TV commercial or even 12 seconds of instrumental music in an episode of the Kardashians, 
the one thing they all say to me is it feels so good to know that your work is being heard by millions of people. Um, it, it's pretty awesome. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell a quick story here that's not in my notes, so I hope I don't get off track. But we had a member that was in his 90s. He recorded some music back during World War II when he was like probably 19, 20 years old. Uh, he was in the Navy. He records some of the music was actually recorded like in those uh, booths where you go in at a place like Coney Island and, and sing into a microphone in a booth, kind of like a photo booth. He kept this stuff all of it um, since, since World War II, we connected him with a publisher that specializes in vintage music. And nowadays, vintage is anything from the 90s or older. Um, and, and this publisher has gotten him so many great placements in big feature films, big TV shows. So I called this gentleman up one day, um, and, and he was hard of hearing. Uh, I called him up and go, who's this again? I said, it's Michael from Taxi, and I just want to say that we're all so proud of you and happy for you that at this stage of your life that you're making extra money by getting all these great placements. And he started yelling at me, young man, it's not about the money, damn it. It's about the millions of people are hearing my music, and that's all I ever hoped for. And thanks to what Taxi did for me and connecting me with this publisher, that's now coming true. And he started crying, and I started getting all teary-eyed. So it was a moment, but we love stories like that. So, um, you know, uh, and frankly, like I said before, they're not necessarily looking for the best song in the world. They're looking for the right music. So do you have to be unbelievably talented and gifted? Is it a competition for who's the, the best of the bunch? Uh, I'm going to tell you another story. We have a taxi member, who's a current taxi member, named Matthew Vanderbo. He's from Nampa, Idaho, a suburb of Boise. Um, he wanted to be, at first, I think he wanted to be a rock star. Uh, and then he came to one of our conventions, the Taxi Road Rally, which I hope you've heard about. I hope you can come one day. Um, and he decided, oh, I'm going to learn how to write country songs because you can pitch your songs to other artists. And he quickly realized that he was never going to have, never going to get up to the level that Nashville's finest are at. And somebody said to him at the convention, why don't you do instrumental cues? So he literally built a very, very simple studio with like a, you know, kind of a mid-level iMac, a $200 microphone, a $300 pair of speakers, um, a little two-octave keyboard, MIDI keyboard. Um, I actually, he didn't even start out with a MIDI keyboard. He was actually playing stuff on his iMac keyboard. And I remember him telling this story. We've actually got him on tape telling the story where he says, yeah, the first time I turned on Pro Tools, I, I saw this blank screen. I didn't even know what to do. So he put that studio in a tool shed in his backyard and just started working at it as much as he could. He was a college professor at Boise State, and he just kept working at it, working at it, working at it, asking all the right questions on the taxi forum, watching episodes of Taxi TV, going to the road rally, um, getting advice from his fellow taxi members. And like five years later, he made enough money that he was able to leave his professorship at Boise State and do music full time. And he's definitely in the uh, pantheon of Taxi's most successful members now. So he would be the first to tell you that he's not the most brilliant composer in the world. He's not the greatest engineer or mixer in the world. He just knows how to do what's necessary, uh, create the right kind of music and get the right kind of mix for what people really need. He just gives them what they ask for. And he's doing really, really well with that. It took him like five years. It takes a lot of people five years or more. It's not a, a sprint, trust me, it's a marathon. If you think that you can join Taxi and send in a few things and everybody's gonna go, you know, holy smokes, this is the most amazing thing we've ever heard. Call everybody in the industry, tell them we found this amazing music. And the pearly gates are going to open up and you're going to get a million dollars in a private jet and be famous. doesn't work that way. We've had a few exceptions where people hit it pretty big pretty early, but those are rare exceptions. For most people, it takes consistent and persistent work over a period of years. And you have to be able to deal with rejection and you have to be patient. But if you do all that, you could be like Matthew Vanderbo and be making a really nice living 
working from a pretty basic home studio, which now, by the way, does have a MIDI keyboard in it. And he bought a new house with the money he makes, and now he's no longer in the tool shed. So there you go. Um, people often ask, so what are the most requested genres in uh, film and TV? So we actually have a page on our website that you can go to. It's taxi.com slash past underscore listings. And it will show you, uh, it, it's updated every day, and it shows you um, how many requests we had for certain genres over the preceding 12 months. So I'm going to read these off to you. Adult Contemporary, five requests over a year. Americana, three. Christian, five. Country, 39. Electronic, 32. Gospel, two. Indie Alternative, 122. Jazz, four, which sounds light to me. Um, oh, I know why, because a lot of the jazzes are under the instrumental category, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, New Age, one. Again, that would probably be under the instrumental category. Punk, five. Advertising, 27. Blues, five. Christmas, holiday. These are all song requests, by the way. Uh, Christmas and holiday music, 22. Cover songs, nine. Uh, folk songs, 12. Um, novelty, four. Instrumental requests, 302. And those come in all of the aforementioned genres. Um, Latin songs, 35. 171 for pop. 113 for rap and hip hop. Uh, 56 for R&B soul, uh, 43 for rock, 77 for vintage. I'm telling you, if you are as old as I am, let's just say in your 60s, uh, even, even if you're like 40 and you have stuff you recorded in the 90s, the vintage music thing is a great way to make money from even demos that you did 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago um, that you don't think are all that good. Um, might be the right thing for the vintage guys because they're looking for um, era authenticity more than they're looking for hit songs or stellar recording. Would they like great songs? Yeah. Would they love stellar recording? Yes. But a lot of times like music that was recorded on a TAC 4 track in 1975 actually can make it into a big hit movie if it's the right vibe, the right lyrical topic, um, the right mood for a particular scene. Um, Singer-songwriter, 46 different listings uh, over that year for singer-songwriter songs and world ethnic music with lyrics, 26. And remember, once again, we had 300, what was it, 302 requests for instrumentals in many, if not most, of those genres I just rattled off to you. Um, so you're probably thinking, uh, I should create a big catalog of music before I join Taxi. No, you shouldn't, and here's why because you don't know what the industry will be asking for tomorrow or next week or a month from now. So instead, what you should do is sign up to get taxi. And this is, I'm not trying to sell you a membership here. I mean, it, it, I don't need your money so badly as I want to educate you. Someday, if you're at a point where you want to join taxi, great. But this is all about education for you. So, um, Oh, you should go to Taxi's website. There's a red button that says something to the effect of get free industry re, uh, alerts. So you get a daily email that will have typically three, sometimes four different opportunities in it. And, and sign up for that. And this way you can see every day what the industry is asking for. Um, you'll never have to guess again. So here's an example of what a country listing uh, for film and TV would sound like. And this one is country songs. Modern, emotionally upbeat country songs with male or female vocals are needed by an A-list film, TV, music publishing company that typically gets really nice high-end placements. These guys are thought of as being a cut above. The company is looking for mid to up tempo songs in the general stylistic ballpark of the following references. Lauren Elena, there are specific songs with links that we send you in every uh, one of these sets of listings so that you can listen and hear the refs. Um, anyway, Getting Good by Lauren Elena, Riser by Dirk Bentley, Road to Happiness by Cam, Good Day by Brett Eldridge. Uh, quoting the company, we're looking for songs with uplifting, non-romantic lyrics. Uh, anything about friendship, being there for each other, overcoming challenges, being confident, having gratitude, being joyful, etc. That was a direct quote from the company. Here we are again talking, please submit contemporary country songs with memorable melodies, catchy choruses, 
polished production and an overall joyful, emotionally upbeat vibe and style. Arrangements and instrumentation in a generally similar style to the references will work best for this. Please be sure that your production is high quality and any virtual instruments or samples you use are cutting edge and fresh. They really don't like dated sounding samples, you know, like old sounding brass or strings from like five or 10 years ago that sounds pretty MIDI driven. Uh, Well-performed vocals with a touch of country charm could seal the deal. Uh, this company doesn't want to hear songs that sound like typical production music, library music. Um, they're interested in finding stuff that sounds like commercial, releasable songs that are ready for the radio. If you're an artist or a band with an online presence, even better. Avoiding specific names, places, dates, times, brands, and profanity are recommended um, just in your lyrics. Uh, leaving those things out makes your song infinitely more licensable. If I submitted a song about, I met my wife Debbie under the Eiffel Tower on a snowy and cold New Year's Eve in you know, 1989, who could use that in a film? Because the story is about me and my wife, Deb, and how we met, which that story was all a lie. We didn't meet in France under the Eiffel Tower on New Year's Eve. Did meet on, on December 15th, close to New Year's Eve. Um, anyway, so you should remember that. That's called a universal lyric. Lyrics that don't have a spe uh, specific names, date, times, places in them. Makes it hard to place. Uh, or a storyline. Instead, I could just say, uh, when I met her, my heart skipped a beat and my life began to change. That's a general universal lyric. Universal lyric does not mean, by the way, universal like everybody will love it. It just means it's universal in its non-specificity. Okay, so there you go. How am I doing on time? I'm 26 minutes in. I got another 30 minutes to go. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Do not submit any material with unauthorized samples of any other artist's music, sounds, or any other form of media. Broadcast quality is needed. Already told you what that is. This company offers an exclusive deal. You'll spit up, sp you'll spit up, uh, split up all upfront sync fees 50 50. So if a placement gets like $3,500 upfront to be in a TV show, the production music library gets half, you get the other half. And then you're going to get 100% of the writer's share, which is the um, performance money, that performance royalties that would be paid to you by your PRO, whether that's ASCAP, BMI, or whatever. Um, anyway, uh, that that's a country song listing for film and TV. Now, here's a country song listing for a music row publisher. Contemporary country slash pop songs with male vocals are needed by a great music row publisher for a billboard charting act. Publishers currently looking for great mid dub tempo songs could be heard on the same playlist as the following references. Long Live by Florida Georgia Line. Lonely A Few Hour by Chase Rice. Good Girl by Dustin Lynch. Please submit top-notch contemporary country songs that showcase a mainstream uh, country pop sound. Your submission should have captivating melodies, unforgettable choruses, duh, uh, instantly memorable hooks, and a well-crafted storyteller lyric that stands out against Nashville's top writers. So see, there's the difference. This one's for, you know, a country artist for radio and records, and they're looking for a lyric with a story, whereas you couldn't do that for film and TV. Um, Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff. It's not that important in, in this context. Noteworthy comment here, if time permits, someone from the publisher staff who's been trained as a taxi screener will actually be screening the music for this request. That means somebody who's directly involved in this request and ultimate pitch could be ears on with your submissions. Um, here's one that I found. This was an exceptionally good one for a TV commercial. Um, we don't get them with $100,000 uh, payouts on them very often, I'll tell you that. We, we'd get a lot for, you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for commercials, hundred grand. We get them every now and then, but not like every week. Fun, positive songs with male or female vocals are needed for an up to $100,000 direct-to-ad agency placement in a promotional video for a huge appliance brand. No publisher splits, meaning that you'll keep 100% of that $100,000 and retain all of your publishing rights. This world-class ad agency is on the hunt for mid to up-tempo songs that could fit on a playlist with the following references that we got directly from the ad agency. Must Be Love by Young Bay, uh, Unstatus Quo by Duckworth, 
Colors by Beck, uh, must have been by Chromio featuring Dram. Um, quoting the ad agency, this video will be an immersive film that takes the viewer on a first-person tour around homes outfitted with the brand's products. Blah, 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 blah. You don't really need to know about that. Um, uh, let's see. Tone should be energetic, mid to up-tempo, not frantic. Uh, vibe should be positive but cool. Track should build or ideally have a moment where the whole piece escalates. Lyrics that deal with style or color are a plus as they could echo a general theme of creativity or expressing oneself. Maybe it's how they make you feel. Add another dimension. These are all words from the ad agency. They speak their own language. <laughs> um, simple, easy to digest, positive, feel-good lyrics could be the way to go in this pitch. Please send fun, fresh songs with a generally similar vibe and feel to the reference tracks. Judging by the references, we think the songs with funky rhythms and instrumentation and tons of great feel-good energy will be the ticket. Uh, your submission should have memorable melodies, super catchy hooks, and an engaging, well-performed vocal. Um, please be sure that your production and any virtual instruments or samples you use are top-notch and modern sounding. The bar will be very high for this, so send in your very best. Please avoid rep references to specific brands, uh, places, names, dates, times, and profanity. Blah, 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 blah. Um, again, $100,000, you would keep all the money. Um, here's a listing for what uh, the kind of instrumental that you might hear in a TV commercial or in a reality show. Um, lots of drumline instrumentals and or instrumental cues are needed for sports programming by a new international music license, licensing company started by a highly experienced, successful founder. Um, this library is brand new to requesting music through Taxi, so chances are you don't have any music in their catalog yet. They're searching for mid to up-tempo instrumentals or instrumental cues in the general ballpark of these references. Dynasty Drumline, Drumline Final Battle, the best drum marching band. Quoting the company, we're looking for greatly produced tracks with excellent performances that are representing the style and genre very well while still staying within the production music rules. That means generally about a 90 second long give or take instrumental means that the whole thing is one repetitive thing generally, believe it or not. Um, and it's all generally an A section that is like the chorus from a song. It goes right into it at the top, maybe like a drum turnaround or a guitar lick. Well, in this case, no guitar lick. Right into the music. Uh, like I said, A section all the way through, except maybe in the middle you go to a B section, um, which is kind of a bridge, but it's all instrumental. It's all drum line. Um, not that hard to make. People want to show off and go, wow, look at this cool rhythm that I can come up with, but you know what? They're looking for stuff that's easily, easily digestible, that doesn't step on a lot of dialogue. So in this case, simple is better. Don't try and show off that you're the most creative person in the world. Um, they're looking for something that has feel to it. It's very visceral, but doesn't step on the dialogue. Um, this is really, really long. I don't really have the time to read it all, but you get the idea. They're looking for um, rhythmically engaging arrangements. Um, simpler is almost always better for pitches like this. Don't try to win percussionist of the year by submitting complex rhythms or too many instruments. Simple but infectious is the goal. Um, so there, oh, in this case, all submissions should be at least a minute and 45 seconds long and no longer than two minutes and 45 seconds with non-faded buttoned endings. Um, gonna deviate from my little script here for a second and tell you that fades are not useful at all. They are shunned by the film and TV market. Um, they need music that ends on a button, which means it ends on a, you know, on the downbeat, um, usually on the tonic, the root. Um, and if it's, you know, it depends on the kind of music, but if it were like a string quartet recording, da -da 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 that's a buttoned ending. Um, an ending for a rock track, ba -da -ba -da, that's called a stinger. It too is technically a button ending. It ends on the downbeat generally. It ends on the tonic generally, but it's bigger and more bombastic. And if need be, they could cut right on the drum beat and just use ba -dum. 
So there you go. As a matter of fact, let's listen. This is my taxi TV music uh, done by one of our members, Keith LeBrant. I played it on the intro of this. Um, this will give you a little bit of a rough idea of, of what an instrumental uh, cue would sound like, although this was made, you know, this is a very short version made for taxi TV, but you get the general idea. There's a stinger ending. Technically a button, but it's bam. So uh, I always say a, a button is a period, a stinger is an exclamation point. Um, so there you go. Um, now you might think, well, gee, maybe it's going to stifle me if I'm creating music to, you know, like fill the needs of what people are asking for. Um, it's going to hurt my creativity. I'm going to feel like I'm prostituting myself. Um, number one, uh, it's kind of like painting houses by day and painting portraits at night. Uh, painting the houses still uses brushes, matching colors, brush strokes, uh, meticulous work, all that stuff. And it prepares you, uh, gives you additional skills for painting portraits at night. So one of the things is your bread and butter that puts food on the table. You can still go for writing hit songs or pitching yourself as an artist and do that work at night. Um, a lot of our successful taxi members actually do that. Um, and they all, to the person, have told me over these many, many years that they don't feel creatively stifled at all. They actually find it invigorating and challenging to write to uh, answer a listing, um, and that there's still plenty of creativity that goes into it. Actually, they like the fact that our listings have deadlines. They like the fact that they get feedback from our A&R team when their music is heard. And they like the fact that they're getting specific direction. Otherwise, they sit down and go, uh, what am I going to write today? And they write something and they build up a catalog of a bunch of stuff and then it just sits there, uncompleted mostly. Why is it uncompleted? I've got a theory which actually I'm stealing from author Stephen Pressfield, the guy who wrote The War of Art. Um, he has a theory that people don't like to finish stuff because once it's finished, then it can be judged. It can fail or, or, or succeed. Um, and if it's unfinished, you always have that excuse in your back pocket. Well, I'm working on this great song, not quite done yet. The day it's done, it can be judged. Maybe it's an epic fail, but if it, you never finish it, you'll never know. Take the chance, finish the material. So I'm gonna tell you a story about when I was a shoe salesman. Uh, <laughs> I was 14 years old and uh, my parents owned a store in a little farm town in Illinois. And the shoe lady was out with surgery one summer. And my dad asked me if I could cover the shoe department. And I'd worked there on some Saturdays, so I said, sure. Uh, if a lady came into the shoe store and asked for a size 7.5B ladies pump, high heel, um, beige, pot de soie, uh, that she could wear along with her bridesmaids dress at her friend's wedding next weekend, and if I brought out instead of that lady shoe in a seven and a half B beige, blah, blah, blah. Um, and let's say I brought out like a Basswegian penny loafer in a nine and a half D men's size. And the lady could look at me and go, well, that is a shoe, but it's not what I asked for. So that's the same thing in film and TV music. All you have to do is give them what they're asking for. It's not just aimlessly creating and hoping that somebody hears your song and go, oh, that's the greatest song in the world. I'm gonna put that in my TV show, even though it doesn't work with the emotion of the scene, the tempo of the scene, none of that stuff. Uh, they, they don't put music in just because it's great. Music supervisors work on film and TV hear great music all the time that they might add to their own personal playlist and listen in their car or wherever, but they can't use it in film and TV because it's just not right for that application. Um, so again, go to taxi.com and there's a red button in the lower left quadrant of the page that lets you sign up so that you can start seeing the listings and get familiar with what the industry um, is asking about. So right about now, you might be wondering, well, exactly how does taxi work? And I'll give you the short version of that. Um, actually, I want to let you know, um, for years, uh, we have said, uh, people's like, well, taxi charges $300 a year. Why should I pay somebody to do that? Um, I've got to ask, 
Do you have the time to make 100 phone calls a week or send out 100 emails saying, do you need music? Here, you know, introduce yourself, do you need music? And write a really professional short email. Uh, what kind of music do you need? Can you send me references? Can you tell me what the deadline is? Can you tell me what the deal is? The people who are doing film and TV music, who are signing it and using it, don't really have the time to do that for a thousand musicians in a week. They're in the business of getting music licensed, so they make money and the people who created the music um, get money as well. So but if you do have the time and the skills to act professionally and be a business person and do all that research and send all the emails and follow everything up, then great, do it. You are your best advocate. But for many, many years, Taxi had a print brochure that said, Taxi, the second best way to get a record publishing or film and TV deal. What's the first best way? You. Um, but, you know, if you don't have the time, like I said, uh, here's how Taxi works. We send you three listings a day. Anytime you see something that you think is a good fit for music that you already have, or more likely music that you will create, you submit your music. When the deadline passes, and usually the deadlines are about three weeks out from the day the listing will first appear in your email box, um, you submit your music the day the listing ends or the day after our A&R team, who we have no interns, no second stringers. Uh, our A&R our people all get paid 30 bucks an hour. They are music supervisors, production music library owner, or not owners, but people who've worked at production music libraries, um, former A&R people, former publishers, um, hit songwriters, hit producers. Um, we pay them 30 bucks an hour to work when they're between gigs, frankly. Um, they would rather you know, keep their head in the musical game rather than sitting around the house twiddling their thumbs wondering when their next gig is going to come up. So we get to uh, utilize their expertise when they're unemployed. Um, or some people uh, aren't even unemployed. They, they do taxi screening as a part-time thing to make extra money. So you will always get heard by somebody who is a real life bona fide expert. You can go to the taxi website at taxi.com and look under, I think it's about taxi and you'll see A&R team and read the credentials of these people. Um, they're just incredible. And uh, so we don't put country screeners on R&B requests. We don't put hip hop screeners on orchestral stuff. We actually take it a step further. We don't let people who screen country music for Music Row also screen country music for film and TV because they're different animals. It's, it requires a different skill set, different expertise. Um, anyway, so there's all that. I can skip that section because I just covered it. Um, anyway, if you, you can do it all yourself, don't join Taxi. You will do it better for yourself. Um, I would also recommend that you don't join Taxi if you have only a few songs that you recorded years ago and you're sure if the right person just heard them, you'll be flying around in a private jet in no time flat. The chances of that happening, not that great, as I said earlier. Um, it, it, taxi's not a great fit for everybody. Like I said, if you've got a handful of old material um, and, and you're just gonna try and, and shoehorn that into every listing even though it doesn't really fit what they asked for you're not going to get results you're going to end up hating our guts and you're going to have a bad taste in your mouth so don't do it um there's so many misconceptions out there about what taxi actually is and does versus what it isn't and what it doesn't do i want to clear some of those up for you this evening i've got seven minutes left okay um is intact. These are actual questions that we get uh, all the time. So I actually made a list of them. Uh, isn't taxi just a pay for play scheme? Pay for play actually means like when you have to buy, you know, a hundred tickets at a bar in order for your band to play there. And then you give the tickets out or sell them to your friends. That's pay for play. Um, taxi doesn't take your money. It's like, hey, if you give us money, we guarantee you're going to get in, get your music in a TV show or a record deal or a cut on an album. We, we don't make that promise. We're very upfront. Um, you need to do your own pitching through Taxi, um, and we make no guarantees, although we have had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of successful members over these 30 years. Um, there's no guarantee. It all comes down to how hard you want to work 
and how right your music is for the requests uh, and how often you pitch and how well you target your stuff, all that stuff comes into play. Um, does taxi work only in specific genres? No, uh, and I read you the list before. Um, I don't know my genre. Do you recommend I find out what my genre is before signing up for Taxi? Actually, you'll learn over time um, because of the listings, because you'll be hanging out with the people in our community in the Taxi Forum. You'll be watching Taxi TVs every Monday at 4 p.m., which, by the way, you can do um, as a freebie. You don't have to be a member. Um, so just go to YouTube and search for Taxi Independent A&R and know that almost every Monday, 4 p.m. Pacific time, we do a live 90-minute show that's kind of like this. Um, so you'll learn about all that stuff just by being part of, you know, you don't live in isolation when you're a taxi member. There's a whole community and kind of a whole ecosystem for helping you learn the business, learn the business etiquette, get better musically, get on, more on target, blah, blah, blah. I shouldn't say blah, blah, blah. That, that's not cool. Um, let's see. Uh, man, I've covered a lot of this stuff. Has the pandemic affected the number of requests you're getting? We thought it would. Honestly, we got more requests than ever during the pandemic. We're, the last like two years or so, our A&R team is bringing in really, really, really good listings from a lot of cool places. So we've got more requests than we've ever had and better ones than we've ever had. Um, do you recommend I get a home studio set up uh, before signing up for Taxi? It's a big help. Honestly, um, if you get feedback on a submission and you go, ooh, the, the vocal is kind of pitchy on that, and you want to go fix the vocal, you don't want to pay 100 bucks an hour to go to a, you know, a, an outside studio to do that. You should do it on Pro Tools or Logic at home. Um, man, I've covered so much of this stuff today. Uh, I only write lyrics. Are publishers only looking for those? It's extremely rare. Like maybe we've had three opportunities for lyrics only in 30 years. If you just do lyrics, don't sign up for Taxi, but find a collaborator. There are plenty of people out there that make great sounding tracks that don't write lyrics. So team up. Um, what are the chances of me getting music signed through Taxi? What's your success rate? Well, our website says 6% of our members get deals. That's very old information that we put up there years before the film and TV thing. We have no actual number because our members don't tell us a lot of times. It's amazing how many people get great placements. Oh, yeah. And they come up to me at our convention. Oh, yeah. Like a year and a half ago, I, I landed a commercial for you guys and I got 30,000 bucks. Well, thanks for telling us. I guess they're excited. They're in the moment. They tell their family and friends. They don't mention it to us. But uh, if you go to our website once again and look at the uh, click wherever it says see member success stories, you'll see that we do get uh, quite a few. And a lot of times, uh, how do you even quantify success? When somebody gets one song signed into a production music library and the owner of that company says, what else do you have? And now they've got seven things in there. That's technically seven successes. And then over a period of six months or a year or five years, whatever it is, those seven things get placed in TV shows. Those are more successes. And then that writer has, or that composer, writer, whatever, um, has re a relationship with the company. They can now submit directly to them without going through taxi. So they have an ongoing thing. So they could have all kinds of su successes for you know, moving forward for years and years. So there's no actual way for us to accurately quantify it other than we're kicking ass and we're not taking prisoners. Um, let's see. Can I submit for friends and bandmates? No. If your name isn't on the copyright or wouldn't be on the copyright, don't submit it. There are legal reasons for that. How much time? I've only got about a minute left to go. Um, Here's an example. I'm not going to read you all these. I'll just read the first couple sentences of three of our screeners. These are actual taxi screeners. Um, Steve Goldman, he was a music supervisor for more than 65 major motion pictures, including The Godfather Part 3, uh, River Runs Through It, Mercury Rising, Full Metal Jacket, great movie, Lolita, and A Walk on the Moon. He also does tons of music supervision for video games such as Brutal Legend, DJ Hero, World of Warcraft, and more. 
Um, he's also produced Laurie Anderson, The Crusaders, Jerry Mulligan, Van Dyke, Park, Van Dyke Parks, Diana Krall, just to name a few. Uh, multiple Academy Award and Grammys and Globe <laughs> Golden Globe nominations. That's just one of our screeners. Lee Schiller, 20 years experience composing, producing, pitching, and placing music and film, TV, and advertising. Um, senior director of A&R and sync licensing at a high-end L.A.-based production supervision and licensing company. Uh, here's Greg Lawson. He's a Grammy Award-winning producer, BMI songwriter um, with credits in music, um, television, and film. While well, two made a list, uh, his credits include the theme on the Keith, Dr. Keith Abloh show, the Grammy Award-winning productions of He Had It Coming, Love is a Crime, and from the movie Chicago soundtrack. Um, he also had a number one smash hit with Jennifer Lopez, Love Don't Cost a Thing, and another one, um, Paid My Dues for Anastasia. So there you go. Those are just a few of them. And finally... I want to tell you about these books, and I'm going to have to hold them. Ooh, I'm a little bit long here. So, buy these books. Demystifying the Genre by Dean Crepane. Gotta buy this book. It actually provides you links where you can hear the actual um, uh, production music library cues that you're reading about in the book. Writing Production Music for TV by Steve Barden. That guy, Dean Crepain, is a taxi member. Steve Barden is another successful taxi member. If you want to learn everything there is to know about writing production music for film and TV, this book's got it. Um, you're going to see a see-through cover now because the book has a lime green cover and I'm working with a green screen. <laughs> there you go. Shortcuts to Songwriting for Film and TV by Robin Frederick. Many of you probably already own Shortcuts to Hit Songwriting by Robin Frederick. This is the follow-up book. It's a sample. It says so right up there. Um, this book specifically talks about writing songs that will get used in film and television. So there you go. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for paying attention. Um, I want to thank John and Ivy one more time for asking me to do this, and I hope the rest of the weekend goes really, really well for you guys. With that, I bid you a fond farewell. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Gotta have theme music. <laughs> <laughs>